Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight because it's a privilege to come to study at your feet. Even if we have been ignorant before, our profiting from your word will appear to all men that they will be able to say, like they said to the apostles, how come these unlearned and ignorant men are so bold, are so knowledgeable, are so wise? They, how, how come they have this insight? The Bible says they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Oh Lord, we are praying that as we come to Bible study, as we come to leadership master class, our profiting will appear to all men. And when they are wondering, did this person go to Bible school? Say, no, he used to go to that Bible study, he used to go to that Tuesday master class. That's where he was for. He used to sit at the feet of Jesus. They would take knowledge of us that we have been with Jesus. That we have been at your feet. And every time we've come to learn. Tonight again, shed your light on your word in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Tonight, we are looking at something that particularly concerns leadership. In Joshua chapter 7, as we read from verse 5, let's see something that particularly concerns leadership. Joshua chapter 7, from verse 5. The scripture says, And the men of Ai smote of them, about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the even tide, he and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought these people over this Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we have been content and dwell on the other side, Jordan, Oh Lord, what shall I say? When Israel turned their backs before their enemies, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall embarrow us round and cut off our name from the earth. And what will thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore lie thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of their cousin thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel will not stand before their enemies or turn their backs before their enemies because they were caused. Neither will I be with you anymore except you destroy their caused from among you. As we are looking at this tonight, we are looking at pastoral prayer in turbulent times. Turbulent times can arise because of persecution. Turbulent times can arise because somebody has done something like Achan. And because of that, God is angry with the whole congregation. How are we to pray at such times? How are we to comport ourselves at such times? This helps us to see what should be the behavior, what should be the prayer, what should be the comportment of leaders at such a time like this. Israel's defeat at air was shocking and devastating to Joshua, especially in the light of the divine promise. 
Remember in Joshua chapter 1, God had told Joshua, nobody will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. But here, AI stood before him. So in his mind, he's wondering, the promise that God gave me, is it not true? God said nobody will be able to stand before me. How come Ahai, the men of Ahai, are able to stand before me? If God gives you a promise and things are going contrary, find out the reason why. God is never to blame. And that's what Joshua is going to discover in this place. So he was devastated. He was completely down and said, how come? Now, every leader should be disturbed and concerned like Joshua at a time of national emergency. If the promise God gave you, things are turning out the other way around. You need to be concerned. You need to be disturbed. You need to pray. You need to get to the root of the problem. Why the promise and the performance are different? Because the performance should follow the promise. And if the performance is different from the promise, you want to know where is the problem. Because here, the performance defeat is different from the promise, the promise of victory. And Joshua is saying, don't understand. It was completely discouraged. Moses, Samuel, and Nehemiah were leaders that prayed in times of national emergency and turbulence. So other people have prayed, you know, in other times in the scriptures like that. Joshua and the elders, they humbled themselves to fast and pray to get through the challenges that they were facing. Look at in verse 6, and this is good. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the even time. He and the elders of Israel have put dust upon their heads. They fasted and prayed. We are in the congregation. We are in the congregation for the time being. There is a burden on leadership to stand in the gap, to find why the problem is there. It is ours to fast and pray. The congregation may join later, but that's not the priority. Here, Joshua and the elders of Israel, they prayed, they fasted, they stayed before God. What an example for us that when we come to times of emergency in the church and we declare praying and fasting, you know, among the leadership, nobody will be saying, eh, why are everybody fasting and praying? Why is this? You can see the example here. They were in a crisis. And Joshua, as the main leader, the elders, as the leaders underneath him, they took responsibility to stand in the gap. They humbled themselves and they prayed. That's what we should do. We, should do. we are learning from scriptural pattern. God has prescribed that the leaders should weep and pray for solution and deliverance in such, at such times. Look at Joel chapter 2. Because these people were doing it, but later, so that's, that's the right thing to do. That is the right thing to do. Joel chapter 2, verse 13. In the time of Joel, Israel was in a crisis. Israel was in a state of turbulence and emergency. And this is God's recommendation. John, Joel chapter 2, in verse 13. It says, arrange your heart and not your garments. We have seen there that Joshua read his, 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 his clothes but of course, you must have rent his garment because if you rent only your clothes and you don't rent your rent your heart, God will see it. He will not. He will know that this just hypocrisy. This is just a, a show off. You rent your clothes. You rent your you rent your heart. Here it says, rent your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And repented him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even the meat offering and the drink offering unto the Lord your God? 
Verse 15, blow the trumpet to Zion. Alert everybody that needs to be alerted. Call them to action that needs to participate. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify the fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. And those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priest. Verse 17, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thy heritage to reproach, that the hidden should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? You see that verse 17? Let the priests. Let the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them stand in the gap. Let them represent the nation before God. And let them pray and say, oh God, we are in a place where we can be wiped out. Let us be wiped out. Spare your people, oh Lord. Don't give your heritage to reproach. Don't let the enemy rejoice over us. They are praying. They are supposed to pray. This is God's recommendation. Pastoral prayer in turbulent times. And I pray that as we are learning, we'll be able to use this pattern, we'll be able to follow and emulate this pattern in times to come for the benefit of the entire congregation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number one, we see the perplexity of a distracting leader in Joshua chapter 7. In verse 5. Joshua chapter 7, verse 5. The Bible tells us there that the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and 6 men. For they chased them from before the gate even unto Shebarim and smote them in the going down. Wherefore, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. The nation was discouraged. Their heart melted. Became like water that is, uh, you know, poured on the ground and cannot be gathered. Everything was scattered. Verse 6, and Joshua rent his clothes. The leader also was concerned. He was devastated. How can we lose this battle? This small city. How can we lose? and fell to the ark upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the even time. He and the elders of Israel have put dust upon their heads. It's a sign of humbling themselves before God. They wear sackcloth, they wear ashes, they turn their, their clothes, tear their, you know, rent their heart and say, God, we are before you. You are the only one that can deliver us and take us out of this mess. And they begin to pray. Perplexity of a deserting leader. Joshua and the elders of Israel humbled themselves and fasted for a whole day. Why did they do that? Times of unexpected defeat calls for a season of praying and fasting. My brother, if you ever experience unexpected defeat, Joshua didn't expect this defeat. He was waiting, thinking the people have gone out and they are going to bring testimony of victory. They brought defeat. He didn't expect it. And any time we have going through a, a times of unexpected defeat, calls for a season of prayer and fasting. Why the defeat? How can we get out of the defeat? How can we turn the defeat around to victory? How can we ascend, you know, from the ashes of defeat to the summit of victory? That's what we need to do here. That's what they did. Unexpected defeat led to praying and fasting. But as we read the prayer of Joshua, that prayer reflected the perplexity of a deserting, disoriented leader. Things have not gone according to the divine promise. Joshua is saying, one. God told me. No man will be able to stand before you 
all the days of your life. The people say, most of the days of your life. All the days of your life. This is still a day of my life. How come the men of AI were able to stand before me? Wow, his mind is troubled. His mind is scattered. He's trying to unravel the situation. What has gone wrong? Where did it go wrong? Who did anything if anything has been done? He wants to know. He wants to get to the root of the problem. We should be that concerned. We want to get to the root of the problem. And Joshua wanted to get to the root of the problem. So, as we saw, his prayer revealed a man that is completely devastated. Analyzing Joshua's prayer reveals a prayer that seems uncoordinated, it seems incoherent. It was almost bordering on accusing God. We're going to see that prayer. But the prayer reflected the perplexity of a deserting and disoriented leader. Things have not gone according to the divine promise. Why? Israel should have won the victory over small Ahab, but they didn't. And instead, they were defeated. Why? Israel should have courageously faced the enemy, but they didn't. And instead, they fled. Wow. Because look at Zenobi chapter 20. God had told them, you know, what should happen. Anytime they go to battle, look at what God told them. In Zenobi chapter 20, I read from verse 1. In Zenobi chapter 20, from verse 1. It says, when thou goest out to battle against thy enemies and seest horses and chariots and the people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee. What we talked about yesterday, divine presence. Even if the enemy outnumber you, divine presence will win the victory. God says, you see chariots, you see horses, you see ammunition more than what you have. You see foot soldiers, they outnumber you by a long distance. Say, don't worry. He said, be not afraid, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So God told them, don't be afraid. And it shall be, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people. So some people who are afraid, they will be told to go back. That was what happened in the time of Gideon. And you remember, 22 people, 22,000 people went back because they were too afraid. And said, we don't need any fearful person here. But here, God said, don't be afraid. Only just they face the enemy. But now they are afraid. They ran away. They couldn't only just they face the enemy. And God is asking, what? This is what Moses said, how we should fight. This is how Israel know they ought to fight. How come their behavior? How come this cowardly behavior on the battlefront, in the, at the, at the battlefront, Joshua is disturbed. Perplexity of a deserting leader. So many questions, so many scenarios were going through Joshua's head. Joshua's prayer was not the planned speech of a, of a victor. It was the spontaneous outburst of a defeated, depressed soul. You know, when you have made the victory, when somebody wins the Nobel Prize, and then they tell the person, on so-so and so a date, you are going to accept the Nobel Prize, and you are going to give a speech. They spend time, they craft that speech. It will be one of the finest they have ever given because they're going to speak to a world audience. It becomes a well-crafted speech of a victor. But here, Joshua's prayer was not the well-crafted speech of a victor. It was the spontaneous outburst of somebody experiencing defeat. It was the spontaneous outburst. Anything that comes to his head, anything that comes to, to his mind, he's just speaking. He's Disabled, disoriented, depressed, perplexed, completely, you know, head is scattered, mind is disturbed, 
That was what happened. So you couldn't have expected this prayer to be a kind of organized prayer. We are coming for night night teaching, and we order all the prayer. These are the prayer points. This is the way we are going to go. He couldn't have done that. This is a spontaneous outburst. He wasn't thinking about it before he's saying it. And that's why he prayed the way he prayed. It was because of perplexity. And that's why sometimes when people pray like that, they are praying out of the body part. Remember the case of Anna? Anna was praying. The lips were moving, but there is no voice. And then I thought, this one is strong. How can you, how can you just be moving your lips and uh, this one is strong? And I have to say that I'm not drunk, but my heart is wounded. My heart is heavy. I'm in anguish. Out of the body of my heart, I've spoken unto the Lord. Eli said, I'm sorry. If I thought you to be one of the daughters of St. Daniel, I'm sorry. Since you are very sincere and you are praying out of the body of your heart, they not give you the petition that you have asked of you. Eli knew that this was a genuine soul. The sorrow and the, uh, and the problem was so deep that she lost herself in prayer. And her behavior is not normal, like somebody praying a normal prayer. That's what happens. So when you see complex people pray, oh, my brother, sometimes the prayer is not normal. The prayer is not normal. And it cannot be normal. Because the person, the heart is boiling. The person, the head is scattered. The person, the mind is confused. The person, everything around him is upside down. And is wondering, how did I come into this mess? Can it be? And then you are telling that person, just be normal, just be calm, just be orderly. You are wasting time. He cannot. He cannot. It's too, it's too much in a shock. Shock that he lost the battle. Shock that he came to this mess. Shock that this thing never happened in his life. He can't, he can't imagine it. Because of that, that's what happened. And you know, there have been people like that that have been perplexed. Perplexed because of the things that they can't understand. Look at Jeremiah chapter 7. You know, God told Jeremiah, go and preach my word. I will be with you. I will make you like a defense city. I will make you like an iron pillar. When you speak my word, you will pull down. You will root out. You will destroy. And Jeremiah went with that assurance. But Jeremiah, he started preaching. There is no rooting out. He started preaching. There's no pulling down. The men of uh, Patros, they said, Jeremiah, for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we know it is, but we will not pack it. We are going to do that which is in our hand. The man said, eh? He said, we will do what is in our mind. We are not going to listen to you. For God told me I will root out. Yes. He told me I will pull down. Yes. He told me I will destroy. Yes. He said, he will make me a defense city and an iron pillar. What am I experiencing? Jeremiah was confused. Jeremiah chapter 20 in verse 7. He said, Oh Lord, thou hast deceived me and I was deceived. Is that, on, is that not an accusation? How can God deceive you? Mm-hmm. But Jeremiah was saying, Oh God, your word in Jeremiah chapter 1 is not what I'm experiencing. Mm-hmm. This is deception. Mm-hmm. You said you will make me a defense city. I've not experienced that. You said you will make me an iron pillar. I've not experienced that. You said I will root out and pull down and destroy. It's not happening. Oh Lord, thou hast deceived me and I was deceived. No God didn't rebuke Jeremiah. Jeremiah. This was a perplexed soul. The mandate that God gave him and the outcomes now, there is no correlation. And Jeremiah is saying, I'm not a false prophet. Did I hear right? Did God really send me? How come what God told me is not what is happening? Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. I had right. Oh God, you have deceived me, and it's unfortunate I am deceived. How can, how can you be speaking to God like that? 
But you know that God didn't rebuke him. This is somebody confused. This is somebody perplexed. Mm. He looks at the promise and the performance. They are not correlating. He, he looks at the mandate and the outcome. They are out of place. And he's wondering, somebody wake me up. What is happening? Mm. That's, that's the situation in which he was. Sweet one. Thou art stronger than I and has prevailed. I am in tension daily. Everyone mocked me. God said, you will be a different city. He said, no, I'm just vulnerable. Everybody, everything can come to Canary. Just come and then they put abuse on me. And it sticks. Which defense city have you made me? Verse 8. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoiled. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of it, nor speak anymore in his name. He even refused. I'm not going to preach anymore. This prophecy is a scam. I give up. You know, just like, uh, you know, it's unfortunate what happened in our church. Mm -hmm. And then some people say, Christianity is a scam. Mm -hmm. Christianity is not a scam. Yes. But I understand that. They couldn't imagine that such a thing like this will happen. How come? They say Christianity is a scam. They are, they are perplexed. Mm -hmm. They are disturbed. They are deserting. Mm -hmm. And they don't know how to handle it. It's just an um, outburst. Just like here. Jeremiah said, God, you deceive me. I'm deceived. This thing is a scam. I'm not going to preach your word anymore. But thank God there was restoration. And if you're like in there will be restoration. Amen. There will be encouragement to your heart. Amen. If the outcome is not according to promise, we will get to the root of it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's important. But you can see that as a prophet. Look at what he got into. To the point of almost accusing God. Look at Jesus chapter 1. Because I want, I want to show you to see that Joshua was not the first person and he was not the last person in that state of mind. Other people are being, and we ourselves can be. We can be perplexed. We can be deserting. You know, Abacom chapter 1, verse 1. The body which Abacom, the prophet, did see. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry and thou will not hear? He will cry out unto thee of violence, and thou will not say, Say, you sent me to these people. I'm praying, you are not asking. I'm praying, and I'm, I'm, I'm shouting to you. You are not even seeing, you are not even observing. He's frustrated. Why does thou show me iniquity and cause me to be all grievous? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore, the law is lacked, and judgment doth, doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceeded. Behold, ye among the eating. And he was frustrated. You sent me as a prophet, but I've not seen any results. I'm condemning wrong judgment, but it's increasing. Instead of righteousness ready, it's wickedness that is uh, that is stopping the stopping the day. And I'm preaching. What kind of preaching? He's confused. He's perplexed. Perplexity of a deserted leader. And who will not be perplexed in that kind of a situation? You are praying. You are preaching. You are doing anything. Doing everything you ought to do. No change. No change. You know, it's like the pastor that gave up his pastorate. And eventually, he resigned. And then he went to go and get a job as, a, you know, a mortuary attendant. And then somebody saw him and said, how come? As a pastor, you are ministering to the dead. How come you can leave that noble occupation of ministering to the dead, and now you have come here, I mean, of, 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 I mean, of uh, ministering to the living, and now you are coming here and you are attending to the dead. It is not, not a good, I mean, good move from being a pastor ministering to the to the living to now being a mortician attending to the dead. 
he looked at him and said, you don't understand. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you my experience. Susan is an alcoholic. I tried to help her for three years. She was getting worse. Instead of, instead of being cured, she got worse as an alcoholic. Say, Dave is a crooked person. I tried to help him preach all the gospel. The more I preached, the more crooked he became. <laughs> Said I was discouraged. I couldn't continue. Said, but you know, I'm happy in this job. Said, God makes you happy. Said, you see today, when I put them straight, they remain straight. <laughs> what you say is, I see results. When I straighten them, they remain straight. I tried to straighten Susan. He was getting more crooked. I started to, to straighten Dave. He was getting more crooked. But here, when I straighten them, they remain straight. <laughs> that pastor is confused, perplexed. He's putting effort, but he's not seeing results. That, that's the reason why that he had to resign to go and take a job as a magician. And who will not? Anybody will? How long can you work without seeing results, without getting discouraged? It is the problem. You get perplexed. And this is what is happening to all these prophets. They are doing what they want to do. They are doing what God sent them to do. But they are not seeing results. They got discouraged. They got perplexed. And look at how they are talking. Oh, God, you have deceived me and I'm deceived. Look at that. I pray you don't miss it. I, I, I talk, I show you violence in our nation. You are not even paying attention. Can you be speaking to God like that? God understands that this is a discouraged soul. This is a perplexed soul. This is a, mm -hmm. a, a soul that has, is down. God does not mm -hmm. judge them. You know, there is a spontaneous outburst from a wounded heart. It's a spontaneous mm -hmm. outburst from a defeated soul. And God yes. understands that. And that's what is happening. You remember? The angel came to Gideon and said, Oh, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon said, Mighty man of valor. Mighty man of valor indeed. If I'm a mighty man of valor, can you see what I'm doing? And the angel is asking, So what are you doing? Assuming I don't know. Say, so You can't see. When we grind wheat, we grind wheat on the threshing floor. When we press wine, we press wine in the wine press. But the unbelievers are eating us. They are taking away our food. But they are not interested in our wine because fruit of the fruit of the vine is, is, is fruit juice. These guys, they want Johnny whiskey. They want Ogogoro. They want Amaro, Amaro Montenegro. So if we are pressing wine in the wine press, they are not interested. So that's why I'm now threshing wheat in the wine press. The enemy would think I'm preparing food juice that they are not interested in. They will pass. It is fear that's making me to do that. Mm -hmm. And you're telling me, thou mighty man of valor. If I'm a mighty man of valor, I will be threshing with the threshing floor and confront the enemy if they confront me. But I'm so cowardly. I'm threshing with in the wine press. Then we are being the, all the miracles that our fathers told us of. It's a scam. Our fathers told us God opened the Red Sea. He took them across the Jordan. Has not that God abandoned us? And then he began. To, he's a frustrated soul. Yes, and every time, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Somebody experiences unprepared for defeat, unexpected defeat. He's disturbed. He's completely, completely disoriented. His head is scattered. His mind is confused. He's asking himself. How can this happen? How can this happen? That's what happened to Joshua. Now let's go and read that prayer of Joshua. That prayer of Joshua. And see even the prayer. Joshua chapter 7 from verse 7. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought these people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites? Let me ask you, what was God's purpose in bringing Israel across the river Jordan? Answer me. To give them the promised land. But look at what Joshua said here. He said, O oh Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all 
brought these people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites. You brought us here to deliver us to the hand of the enemy. Of course, that is not true. But his mind is cut. What he's seeing is, this is what is happening. God brought us across Jordan. Mm -hmm. Now we're experiencing defeat. Why did he bring us here? To experience defeat? He says, scattered mind. Now, let's read on. Then he says, to destroy us. Did you bring us across Jordan to destroy us? Look at it. Would to God we have been content and dwelt on the other side of Joshua said, I regret the day we crossed the Jordan. It would have been better for us to stay there and not cross the Jordan. These were people that celebrated when they crossed the Jordan. These were people that celebrated when the when walls of Jericho came down. Now that same leader is saying, I wish we never came across the Jordan. I wish we were still on the other side. You know, defeat makes people to be thinking about the past. The past that was not even really good. Mm. Then you glorify that past. You remember the children of Israel, a little defeat, a little problem in the wilderness. They said, we remember the, 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 the which we ate in Egypt. You eating flesh. Did the Egyptians mm. ever give you flesh? When no, ate, we eat. Then we remember the cucumber. Do you know how cucumber tastes? And that's what they are remembering. Yes, yes. God, God is giving them manna. They, 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 they hate manna. God is giving them quails, real meat to eat. Then they are saying, we remember the cucumbers and the leeks and the onions. You, oh, you glorify <laughs> the past of slavery because of the present difficulty that you have. And you glorify the past. That's what happened to somebody who is distraught, who is who is perplexed, who is discouraged. Mm -hmm. So Joshua was saying, I wish we never crossed the Jordan. And those prayer. Now, look at him and says, Oh Lord, what shall I say? When Israel turned their backs before their enemies, oh God, what will I say? They celebrated us. Fame ran all around the whole country in chapter six. Now they say uh, it was fake. Maybe it was just a fluke. It was just by mistake or just a coincidence that they conquered Jericho. We didn't know that these people could not fight. He said, this is what's going to happen. Verse 9, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall embarrow us around. And shall cut off our name from the earth. He said, when all the enemies hear that this small guy put us on the run, they will be emboldened. And say, let's wipe out this Israel. We didn't know that they can't even fight. He said, they will embarrass us or not and cut us off. And Joshua said, and what shall you say unto thy great, what would thou do unto thy great name? He said, you are a great God. Is it when they have wiped us out as your people, that you'll be able to tell the people that wiped us out to a great God. He was just praying. You know, it was the prayer of a downcasted leader, prayer of a disturbed soul, prayer of a disgusting leader, prayer of a perplexed individual. And God, you know, he hears that kind of prayer. He knows you are praying me from the turbulent heart. So God is not going to analyze the grammar and the logic and everything and say, is it me you are talking to like that? You don't mm -hmm. even know your faith. No, God understands the human mind more than that. <laughs> because otherwise, God will be challenging you. I brought you up, I brought you across the world. Why are you praying that? Because God didn't do that. Because of the state in which Joshua was, a state of shock that Israel, Israel, Lost that battle. He didn't expect it. It was an unexpected defeat. Yes. The prayer of Joshua may seem at first analysis to be to be heavy-handed and a bit overboard. This is the prayer of a downcasted leader, the supplication of a dejected soul. It was the prayer of disappoint of a disappointed leader whose mandate seems to have failed. Joshua's heart was troubled. His head was scattered. The emotions were raw. Number one, 
He said, oh God, why did you bring us onto, uh, in, in the first place to this place? Can you be craving God like that? Number two, did you bring us here to deliver us to the enemy to finish us? Number three, it was better that we were resting peacefully at the other side of Jordan, never crossing River Jordan, and he's praying. The prayer doesn't look logical, doesn't look reasonable. What is the prayer of a disturbed soul? The excitement of crossing River Jordan is already evaporated. Defeat has a way of making past joy and excitement to evaporate. I pray that the joy that God has given you, the excitement that God has given you, will never evaporate in Jesus' name. Amen. Defeat has a way of making you forget the goodness of, of God in time past. You are only experiencing the pain of the present situation. But always remember, God has been good in time past. Be careful. You know the death of Uza? You know when they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem? Everybody was, they were celebrating. David was dancing. Then, the cat that was bringing the, the, the Ark shook. And Uzzah thought, let me defend it. The ark must not fall down. And that is contrary to what God has said. Nobody was to touch the ark. The ark was carried with, you know, with rocks. One person there, one person there, one person there, one person there. The ark would be in the middle. The rod is true, those things. But Uzzah touched the ark, and God just struck him straight, he died. David said, eh, what kind of a God is this? That celebration fizzled out. David said, no, no, no more celebration. I cannot take this act to Jerusalem. They just abandoned him in the nearest house, in the house of Obededon. Again, what do we learn from there? The death of Uzzah made all the celebration of the return of the Ark of the Covenant to evaporate. One disaster, the joy and the celebration fizzled out. What am I going to do as a leader when my people are put on the run by the enemy. That's what is going on. That's the prayer of Joshua. This defeat will embolden other enemies to round us up and cut off and cut us off from the earth. That's his prayer. When we have been wiped out, what will you as God do to your great name? He's telling God, we are not the only one that is going to suffer if they cut us off, even you. You will not be able to oppose before the enemy. You are a great God. Say, so great God. Why didn't you save your people? So, God, we are in need to get out. If they cut us off, you yourself, your reputation is at stake. But that's prayer. How are you going to be telling God that, God, we are in need to get out? If they cut me off, your reputation is at stake. It, 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 it's like forcing God to do something that, even for your name's sake, you better, you better, you better quickly rise up and do something. It's not only for me, it's for you also. You know, it's disturbed. You know, and I've seen people that have prayed like that before. And when they pray like that, you don't, don't judge them. Their hearts, their emotions are too raw. Their hearts are too upside down. In their sober moment, they would not have prayed like that. But now, they are too disturbed. They are not coordinated. That's what happened. The prayer is not disrespectful of God. We need to understand that. That prayer is not disrespectful of God. But just shows the uncoordinated state of a troubled heart. We can see the rational prayer, the rational request and behavior of Elijah, of Jeremiah, in similar circumstances. How can Elijah be praying and saying, oh God, come and kill me? Is God a killer? A killer of his people? No. A killer of the righteous? No. A killer of the person bringing revival to the nation? No. It was this story. That was why Elijah said, oh God, come and kill me. It was this story. And Jeremiah said, oh God, I'm this I'm not even going to preach your word again. I give up. God understands. God understands. And anytime when we are down, we need to pray. Pray anyhow. 
God understands. But make sure you pray. Make sure you fast. Make sure you stand in the gap. Some things have happened into your, in your family that you can't understand and you are very distraught and disturbed. Fast and pray. Your prayer will not be as coordinated because your mind is too disturbed and too scattered, even to be logical. Pray anyhow. God understands. He hears you. It's a prayer of a downcast leader. May God help us to be leaders that can stand in the gap of stubborn times like this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Joshua and the elders of Israel, they were standing in the gap for Israel. That how come we experience this defeat? Oh God, we want to know. And then they were praying the way that we didn't expect this. From God of heaven, he will answer. Do people get discouraged? Oh, I remember very many years ago, there was a time because of what, you know, how the church was treating me, I was very discouraged. In fact, I got to the point of resigning, giving up. But I went into some prayer and fasting, say, God, I'm discouraged. God, of course, people didn't know in the church. I still come, I preach my message, I still come, I encourage people. But deep down, I was discouraged. And do you know that God answers prayer? I poured my heart onto God. Even my wife did not know because I didn't want to discourage her. I was thinking of writing a letter and send it to Nigeria. I resigned. And then one day, God came to me and God asked me the question. Two words. Do you want to resign? Or do you want to resign? And God explained it to me. You can resign from your commission. It's your choice. Or do you want to sign that commission again and say, no, God, I consecrate afresh to serve you. Irrespective of the way they are treating me. I consecrate myself to go on. Are you resigning or are you resigning your call? Hmm. I told God, I will resign my call. I will sign it again. I will start afresh. I consecrate myself unto you. In fact, that time, I preached some messages in the church. People are wondering and say, Why? Wow. I preach some messages on the life of Elijah because God revived me. God restored me. God encouraged me. When I told him, I'm not resigning anymore, but I resign my, I sign again my commission. I sign again my call. I consecrate myself afresh to this call. I was, God helped me. It was like one horrid experience for Elijah. In fact, if you go and look at your outlines, you will find the message is called resigning or resigning. A question mark. That's my own experience. So that sermon was my own experience. Amen. Amen. If, if you go and look at that message, you will see resigning or resigning. Question mark. I preached a message like that in the church. That was my experience. Most people didn't know. Everybody can be discouraged. Elijah was discouraged. Jeremiah was discouraged. Joshua was discouraged. The things they went through brought discouragement. But thank God, the way they handled it. Elijah went to Montorin, he came back fortified. Jeremiah overcame his problem. Joshua overcame this problem and went on again, eventually conquering. But what did they do? They prayed. They prayed. They fasted. And God came to their rescue. We will pray. Amen. God will come to our rescue. Amen. We will pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's a prayer of a downcast leader. 
did God hear that prayer? You would have been thinking that maybe God is going to reveal Jeremiah. No. God is going to say, why are you praying like that unto me? No. Our mm. God is a good God. Yes. Look at what he did. Joshua chapter 7, verse 10. And the Lord said unto Joshua, get thee up. Wherefore lies thou doors upon thy face? Why are you praying the way you are praying? Why are you lying down on your face? Verse 11. Israel had sinned. God was played. This is the reason. Israel had sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of their cousin thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel will not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before them, before their enemies, because they were cousin. Neither will I be with you anymore, except to destroy their cousin from among you. God was playing, plainness of the divine law. God told Joshua exactly the problem. Why the defeat came? It's not that your army was not strong enough. It was because they had seen in the camp. And the person that stole, he has eaten the stuff among his own stuff. The thing he stole, he has eaten it among his own stuff. God gave him revelation. If we will pray and fast like that, we will have revelation. Amen. We will have revelation. Amen. So that's what happened. When we seek God with our whole heart, we will find him. That's Jeremiah chapter 29. When you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. God responded to Joshua's prayer. God told him, get up from the ground to face the issue at hand. Israel has sinned and transgressed divine commandment. Israel has taken their other thing, the voted thing unto the Lord. Israel has stolen what belongs to God. Israel has dissembled. Israel has eaten the on, on high table among their stuff. And I'm asking you tonight, are you hiding the unhidable? Say, nobody saw me when I took it. God saw you. And even if you try to hide it, God will, God will bring it to light. Don't try and hide the unhidable. Evil sin will be exposed in time or in eternity. Your sin will find you out. Trying to cover sin is hiding the unhidable. The Bible says that covering his sin will not prosper. Your sin will find you out. Don't try to do what he can do, hiding the unhiding. God said, somebody has told it. He has eaten it among his stuff. He thinks that he's safe, but I'm telling you, I saw it all. Dig it up, eliminate him. Don't hide the unhiding. Number two, man may do all the searching like labor without finding the teraphim, the Rachel he, but God's revelation will bring it out. You remember, Laban said, somebody stole my gods. And Jacob said, I did they steal your gods? Check. And Laban went through everywhere. For it was Rachel that stole that teraphim. And Rachel put it, you know, in the, in, inside the city was city, she was sitting on and told the father, well, you can search everywhere, but you know, I'm pregnant and I'm heavy, I'm tired, I cannot stand up. So the father said, no, 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 see, 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 sit down. But the thing that has been stolen was eating. It was inside where it was, she was sitting. So Laban could not find anything. And Jacob said, now you have searched all my house. You have searched all my things. Why are you accusing me? For truly it was stolen. But even if somebody does that, God has a way of revealing it. It cannot be hidden. Man may try all the searching and not find it. But when God is involved, that thing will come out. Don't hide your hide it. We are dealing with God, the Bible says, with whom there is no secret. He knows it all and he can tell it all. God gave these the reasons to Joshua for Israel's defeat and their inability to stand courageously to face the enemy. God also gave Joshua the way to move forward, eliminate the offender. Seeking the Lord with all our heart brings a harvest of solutions. If we will seek God in time of defeat, we will get to the root of the defeat. 
God will tell us what to do, how to, if we need to repent, to repent, if we need to clean up, to clean up, and then the way forward into victory, he will tell us. That will be divine revelation. But it means that we are seeking God properly. Don't be like people that they are praying and fasting, but they are not sincere. They are not honest. They are not genuine. God still answer. When we answer like Ezekiel 14, I will answer you according to the multitude of the idols in your heart, not according to his will. He will answer, but like he answered there. And my God said, you go, you go to battle, you will win. He mm -hmm. said, I know you are not serious. I know that's not what God has told you. Have I not told you I want to hear the truth? When they have the truth, did they, did they like it? No, so sir. when you have a preconceived mind, God will answer you like that. But when you have a genuine heart, you are honest. You are saying, God, I truly want to know my state. He will show you. He will tell you. He will reveal it. And Joshua and Israel, they were truly ready. They wanted to know where the problem, where the trouble was. And they were going to take action. And you will see in subsequent weeks, as we go through this chapter, they truly took action. God gave them revelation. They acted on the revelation. It means that they were ready to hear what God was going to say and to do his bidding. Are you ready to hear what God is going to say? Are you ready to do his bidding? If things have gone wrong in your life, fast and pray. Humble yourself before God. But be ready to listen to God. God is playing. He wasn't putting any embellishment. He just said, Israel sinned. Very, very direct. Very, very plain. There is no dancing around it. It was so straightforward. Israel had sinned. And that's why this defeat, God will be playing to you if you are serious, if you are genuine, and if you are open. I pray to God himself to help us in Jesus' name. Amen. How to pray in turbulent times. How to pray and stand in the gap for the people. How to weep between the porch and the altar and cry. Spare your people, O oh Lord. Don't give up to reproach. Don't let us suffer the defeat on a permanent basis. Show us your salvation. Tell us where things are going on. We are ready to make a name. Come back with your presence into our life. That's the purpose of leadership. Pray the Lord will make us to be responsible leaders in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and pray. Help me tonight that God help me as a leader, help me as a pastor to pray. In times when the church is experiencing some defeat, oh God, help me to pray. To seek your face. This is the way to get out. Stand to our Lord. This is the way to get out. The Lord has said that the thing is according to your way. According to your word, in a troubled time, it's such a thing. To God, in the night that you are the God of battles, and the Lord in times of perplexity, Lord, I will seek your face, O Lord, that God. Help me, Lord, that in the dark hour I will seek your face. Whenever there is problem, help me, Lord, that in times of discouragement I will seek your face, so Lord, that I will be strengthened to pray, Lord. That I will be encouraged to pray, Lord, even as David encouraged himself in the Lord. As a fasted day, Lord, in the times of troubles, at the time of his parents, I will encourage myself in the Lord. Find your God in the Lord. Find your God in the Lord. my Lord, because I am not bad or a poor God. You are a good Father. You are a good Father. You are a good Father. Lord, help me to understand the Lord.
Father, help us to follow this noble pattern of Joshua and the elders at a time of national emergency and turbulence. Slow. They didn't go and be blaming the people. You caused mm -hmm. this damage. You make us, you made us to be defeated. Instead mm -hmm. of arguing with men, mm -hmm. they went to prostrate before God. They prayed. They fasted. Instead of blaming people for the defeat, they wanted mm -hmm. to, to get to the root of the problem. They fasted. Mm -hmm. They humbled themselves before God. Mm -hmm. Even though their prayer was not logical, their prayer was almost bordering on accusing God, but God understood that this is the prayer of somebody who is disturbed, disoriented, downcast, somebody who is disheartened, somebody who is perplexed, somebody who's, who's, whose mind is scattered, somebody whose emotion is raw, somebody who's, whose heart is troubled. God knew, and because of that, they were speaking in uncoordinated way, but God understood. God didn't blame him. God didn't chastise him, but God answered. God knew that this person was genuinely seeking him, wanting to know answers. Why is the performance different from the promise? Why is my outcome different from God's mandate? And God told him, the reason behind this defeat, there is sin in the camp. And this is what to do, this is what to do, this is what to do. Oh God, I pray that when the church experiences any setback, when there are difficulties in the congregation, that we as leaders will set ourselves to fast and pray. And as we do so, you will respond from heaven. You will yes. show us the way. You will get us to the root of the problem. And you will show us the way forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The insight you are giving us tonight that this is the way to handle things in the church of the living God. This is the way to be responsible leaders in times of emergency and in times of turbulence. It's not the time to give up. It's the time to buckle up. It's not the time to run away. It's the time to consecrate and to pray. It's not the time to be accusing men. It's the time to come before God wanting to know the answer. And the God of heaven, he will respond in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen.